So this is a situation I want you to think of. Um, I guess if you want a more kind of closer to real life example, then it's uh, this one that you want to think of. Uh, this is one of the problems in your problem set. Um, let me open just the image. So this is a description of some setup where you have a pool. There's a, uh, you know, a, a, a calm pool surface. So this is illustrating refraction. So there, there's a guy here who's um, um, out in air. Um, the line of sight from him. So you kind of have to imagine. The, the way we draw line of sight, often it'll look like the light is coming out of the eye and then into water. Unless you are Superman, it work, doesn't work that way. It works the other way. <laughs> light is originating from here, coming up, refracting here, and then entering your eye. Um, the good thing is with these uh, rays that we draw, the direction actually doesn't matter. Uh, whether light rays are going one way or the other, it bends the same way, traces the same path. So you can kind of pretend that there's a ray coming out of the guy's eye, entering water, and then bending down that way. Um, so that's the refraction, right? Now, this is what I want you to imagine. How do you think this refraction will change as this angle becomes larger and larger? That is larger measured from normal. What's the largest this angle can get? 90 degrees, right? The almost the grazing angle. So if we have this uh, as the boundary between mediums one and two, then what you can imagine is, um, so you could have something that's drawn like this, kind of pretty normal, general kind of description. But another thing you can have is you can have, let's say, this is where it's going to cross, and the light can be coming so close to the surface that this angle here is essentially 90 degrees. Now, how do you think this will refract? Will it, how many think it will go straight, in a, in a straight line, so that this is also 90 degrees? You think that might happen? OK, um, I guess uh, it's. Uh, yeah, I don't have a lot of good optics demos that I can show on the board. Sorry, I wish I did. You will see that some of them in the lab um, next week. Um, so this is where it, uh, this is one of the goals in physics. In many areas that we deal with in physics, you won't have good intuition for. That, uh, that was true in physics 4A and 4B. Even when you're doing mechanics, sometimes the intuition you have is not the correct intuition. In physics 4C, it's uh, especially even more true that you simply do not have the intuition. When you, when, for optics, maybe some of you do. When we get to special relativity and quantum mechanics, we have a saying, nobody is born with the intuition for special relativity. Nobody is born with the intuition for quantum mechanics. So one of the goals in physics is that you start to build that intuition. And the number one tool you have for that is the mathematical relationships that we introduce. So here, we're going to start out with that. The, what we can rely on is that Snell's law is true. We even derived it last time looking at the wavefronts. So we start out with that. The n1 times sine theta1 is equal to n2 times sine theta2. Let me make this a little bit more realistic and give you actual numbers. Let's say this is air and this is water. Same as what's in that picture over there. So anybody here know, remember the index of refraction of uh, air? Approximately? Approximately one? one? Yeah. Close enough to one that we are going to say it's one. Uh, I think I did mention water last time. Anybody remember? Yeah, 1.33. Um, so index of refraction in water is 1.33. All right, so this is an expression containing three different, uh, sorry, four different symbols. And I know two of them. Do I know value of any of the symbols? Which one? Theta one. Yeah, we know theta one, 90 degrees. So what's the left-hand side, actually? 
Just the one, right? Okay, that's promising. Now, I think this is a point where you have filled in enough of the blanks. Now you can intuitively guess some of the features of theta 2. Will theta 2, the outgoing angle, so you know, this was theta 1. Will my theta 2 be 90 degrees? No, right? This is bigger than 1, which means this has to be smaller than 1 so that this can, um, uh, you know, that, so that the product can equal 1. Right? And um, I guess, uh, let me just do, so if you work out the expression algebraically, what that would be is theta 2 is, let me do this in my head, arc sine of n1 sine theta 1 over n2. Did I do the algebra correctly? Yes? Yes. Okay, let me plug in those numbers so that we have something concrete. Um, so we are looking for arc sine of, well, I guess 1 divided by 1.33. I wish I could do that in my head, but I can't. Radians, okay, there it is, degrees. 48, wow, that is a lot smaller than I would have guessed. So if I'm trying to draw this to scale, it would look something like this. This is the refracted ray going out at an angle of something like 49 degrees or so. Good? Yeah, and you know, if you didn't have this intuition before, then now hopefully you do. That, so, and um, this fits with a more conceptual descriptive, well, description of refraction that you may have heard. When a light ray goes from material of a smaller index of refraction to the larger index of refraction, Anybody here have heard the phrase that follows in conceptual physics? The light ray bends towards the normal, and that's what it does here. And the amount it bends, um, if you go through this numerically, you will see the, how much it deflects, it actually gets bigger as this angle is bigger. So when it's at 90 degrees, then it doesn't bend at all. Or, or sorry, when it's at zero degrees, then it comes out at zero degrees. Um, as it goes from zero to 90 degrees, the difference, the amount you see here as a proportion of the angle does get larger. Um, so all right, that's it. Um, nothing all that surprising. The feature, the surprising feature that I want you to bring up, and this is the feature that's called total internal reflection. It comes in from a slight modification of this picture. So this is what you have seen. When you were coming straight down, so if you had a ray of light, if you had a ray of light coming straight down, then it would have, um, so theta 1 is 0, then theta 2 would be 0, it would have gone out like this, right? And you can imagine, as this sweeps across, this will sweep across this way. When would this ray, outgoing ray, ever be in this region? Never, right? Which uh, means, so this is what I started out this section with, that when you have a ray of light, the direction doesn't matter. You could actually go the other way, and it would trace out the same path. Now, what, you're, what we are seeing is that if we are imagining the source of light starting from this side of the boundary, then here's this region that the light rays will never reach. Now imagine that you have some source of light here. I don't know, this is my light bulb. Imagine you have a source of light here. And there's a, let's say there's a light ray that's going towards this point. So this is my light ray that's going towards that point. If there is any refracted ray, how should it refract? I mean, so it's going from the higher index of refraction to smaller index of refraction, right? So you would expect it to bend away from the surface normal. But here's the thing. Um, this, this ray, when you reverse the direction of this ray, is supposed to go like this. 
So this ray should be even larger angle than that. Is that possible? No, it's not possible. In fact, when you plug in the numbers into Snell's law and try to do the calculation, you will see. Depending on your calculator, if you solve for theta 1, either you get uh, out of domain error or you get a complex number, <laughs> depending on your calculator. So this is the condition where total internal reflection happens. So if your the light is coming from this range, there's no, um, well, it cannot refract. There's, there's no way to get a ray on this side that's consistent with uh, Snell's law. So what happens is there is still energy in this ray of light. It all has to go somewhere. And what it does is instead of refracting, so refraction doesn't happen at all, it all reflects. This is what's referred to as total internal reflection. And when you look at very high quality optical instrument, uh, I guess they use this in binoculars. Um, even the best mirrors, like those metal mirrors, the highest uh, reflection you can get, well, metal mirrors actually are not that good. They have 95% uh, reflection. Um, if you want 100% loss-free reflection, um, this uh, uh, total internal reflection is one of the ways. If you have this uh, very high quality uh, boundary, then so there's no um, like energy loss uh, with the interaction that's going on at the boundary, then um, this beam is prohibited going, uh, ref prohibited from refracting through to this side. So all of this incident energy has to reflect and come out on the same side. So, um, so this expression that I wrote down, uh, I can get the critical angle for total internal reflection from here. So let's say I wanted the um, theta critical angle. So this would be the smallest theta at which total internal reflection happens. Any theta larger than that will always lead to total internal reflection. Any theta smaller than will have some refraction. So this was uh, um, this is just came from Snell's law. It's just Snell's law rewritten. What condition would you impose on this to say this is the critical angle? This is the smallest angle at which total internal reflection will happen. So one small condition. Sorry, somebody was saying something, but I did, couldn't see. Smaller or, you said the 90 degrees, right? Which angle were you referring to? Theta one or theta two? Theta two, the angle on this outgoing side? Yeah, theta, the, the angle on the incoming side, right? So, um, if you have an optical arrangement that would lead to theta one being anything smaller than 90, would it result in total internal reflection? No, 90 degrees that critical angle for theta one. So for a critical angle for theta two, I am going to set my theta one equal to 90. So 90 degrees. So sine of theta one will be one. So this critical angle, it should be equal to arc sine of N1 over N2. So if you have an incident angle, that's a, so you know this would be my incident angle. If you have an incident angle that's a larger than this critical angle, that's what results in total internal reflection. And um, so this is something I'm hoping that you will eventually learn to do on your own. If you look at this expression for a little bit, uh, for a right length of time. I hope you will notice uh, one condition you can say is necessary for total internal reflection to happen. Because it's not true that you can always get total internal reflection. Like, um, I don't know, last time I had a, well, so I have this beaker of water. If I have this beaker of water and I shine light from um, outside into this water, no matter what I do with it, like, so you can see how much is reflecting there, right? And no matter what I do, you will never get total internal reflection here. 
So there are some particular condition that I need to be able to meet that with this setup, me shining laser light into beaker, I will never get. And if you stare at this for a while, you can figure out what that condition is. Any guesses? N1 has to be smaller than N2. Yeah, why, should N, why does the N1 have to be smaller than N2? Um, have you? <laughs> you are answering. Yeah, so you look at the arc sign. So this is what a physicist or an engineer, someone who's trained in quantitative science does. Arc sign is in your formula, and this function has some requirements. It doesn't have a domain of all real numbers, unless you extend it to complex domain. <laughs> so it only can produce a, a reasonable answer from minus one to one. So if somehow something causes your input to go outside of that range, then that causes it to behave in a way that you weren't expecting. So yeah, here the condition is that n1 must be smaller than n2. That means here, n2 was the incident side. So the light has to be coming in from the side that has higher index of refraction. So for me to get total internal reflection here, I'll have to put this laser into water and shine in from water. But this isn't waterproof, so I'm not going to do that. Um, so there are other arrangements that you can use to get total internal reflection with the light starting from air. One of those you will see in your homework. Let me see if I can find it without wasting too much time. I um, feel like it's one of these. Um, Ah, okay, this one. So this is a, this arrange, this shows one arrangement where you can get the total internal reflection. So imagine this is a prism. So when the light comes in normally here, it doesn't bend at all. Now on this surface, now it's coming in from the glass side, trying to go into air. So you can have total internal reflection on this surface. So, but that's an important feature in total internal reflection, and it's built right into the this formula. And then you think about it for a while. This formula itself, it's like I never actually memorized this because you can get it directly from uh, Snell's law. If you just remember that for the critical angle, what you are thinking is you want theta 1 to be 90 degrees. 